uh, so we we are recording this uh, event and uh, probably like by the end of today i should be able to give you the recording Megana, should we kick right off as we are arriving at 1201 or are we waiting for more or I think we can wait for another couple of minutes. Um, okay. We expect uh, some more audience. Okay. So, yeah. Sounds good. So Elizabeth, I'll tell uh, my son, he is RJ, Richard Jr. Uh, okay. that, uh, he should uh, it, it, come find you at some point. <laughs> Say yeah, hello. certainly. I usually, uh, you know, regardless of um, which track they're in, whether it's entrepreneurship, supply chain, um, org behavior, anything like that, they usually end up taking one of the classes I teach. It's called um, Analyzing the Global Social Business Environment. Um, the CRN is 1203. Um, and okay. the reason they take it is it's, it's a requirement for all DeMore McKim students to take the international business course. Um, okay. So it's just an introduction to IB. So I, I'm I'm curious if, he, if he's taken it or not. I'll find yet. out. And if not, <laughs> if not, maybe I'll if not, maybe I'll see him. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Are the students back to campus, Elizabeth? We are. Yeah. We are all back. We are in. Yeah, we we did the flex last year, um, and it was it was fairly successful. I was I I actually was one of the faculty that stayed on campus teaching from the classroom, even with flex, but we are all back. Uh, we are all back in person now. Wonderful. Wonderful. Full classrooms. It's good. It's great to see people even with masks. It's, it's, it's really good. My sister-in-law is a grad of Northeastern and my, my um, nephew and her dad was a um, faculty member on the engineering in the engineering wow. school. Yeah. Okay. So we have lots of, connections to the university lots, lots of connections to the huskies go huskies <laughs> <laughs> is that uh, richard is your um is your son doing or in the process i know that it's co-op season now is he yeah. is he in the he, middle of that or he did he did his first one last year actually second semester so he was home through the uh, summer and he worked for vertex pharmaceuticals which is yep, yep. downtown well it was all virtual he's actually was going to go meet everyone he worked with last week. Um, and then he's going to work for a small consulting shop that's downtown in Boston. The folks came out of like ENY or Deloitte or somewhere, and mm. he's going to uh, do that at, at general consulting, <coughs> con, uh, management consulting this uh, this next semester. Oh, very good. That's, and that's it's in really person. exciting. He'll, be, he'll stay in Boston for that. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah. I am. Um... I'm leading it. I don't know if I don't know if your son is interested in them or not, but I'm I'm leading a dialogue, um, which is where we take them, you know, abroad for for six weeks or so. And I just learned that the second co-op cycle, so the one that is the the fall co-op cycle, mm -hmm. prevents students from taking any dialogue. So I was quite sad to learn that. I I don't know why yeah. they why they designed oh. it like that, but mm -hmm. yeah, but co-op is good nonetheless. <sighs> oh my God, if you want to just give me a thumbs up when you when you when you think we've we've exceeded our wait time I, I don't want to keep I, anyone in I think like we can uh, start off with the event so as and when people keep coming so they can keep joining as well okay. but I think we'll run behind if we don't start now so okay sounds sounds yeah. good so I will get us underway um so thank you to all of you who have joined me thus far um my name is Dr. Elizabeth Moore I am um <clears throat> associated with Global Resilience Institute as a faculty fellow also as a strategic <laughs> associate director for strategic research coordination um I also am a faculty in the DeMore McKim School of Business and the International Business and Strategy Group. And I'd like to welcome all of you to our resilience conversation. Um, today's topic is cybersecurity and resilience issues of the grid. Uh, we are delighted to host Sudeen Kelly and Richard Mraz from Protect Our Power. Um, and today's conversation, as you know, is hosted by the Global Resilience Institute um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and the Global Resilience Research Network, which was co-founded by the Global Resilience Institute in collaboration with Germany's Fraunhofer. Um, and, and what we are is we're a global membership network of researchers, practitioners, uh, and scholars really collaborating to really bring the interdisciplinary flavor and knowledge to support resilience across multiple sectors. Um, so we really are trying to bring in skill sets and develop novel tools 
um, from a variety of different fields globally, which um, gives us a lot of a lot of important stake in the game here. Um, with us today are Sudeen Kelly um, and Richard Ross. I'll let them explain um, the, wh who they are and what they are a little bit further as it relates to Protect Our Power, but just a brief overview of our distinguished guest here. Sudeen is a partner at Jenner & Block, uh, where she co-chairs the firm's Energy Practice and Regulatory Council for Protect Our Power. Um, for more than 15 years, she was a professor at the University of New Mexico School of Law, where she taught energy law, uh, utility regulation, administrative and legislative processes. She also served as the chairwoman of New Mexico's Public Service Commission and was a lawyer at the National Resources Defense Council and a partner in the Albuquerque firm of Lubin. I apologize if I'm, if I'm mispronouncing that, but Lubin, Hughes, and Kelly. So welcome to Sadine. And if I've missed anything, Sadine, as soon as I'm done, please do jump in. Um, Richard Mraz is also here with us. He's a founding member and managing director of Resolute Strategies, LLC, and a senior director of Archer Public Affairs in Trenton, New Jersey, and Washington, D.C. He also serves as a senior advisor to protect our power. Um, and Richard Mraz is also the past president of the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities, serving as a chairman and chief administrative officer of the agency and function as the chief energy officer of New Jersey. Um, he's also the chairman of the Critical Infrastructure Committee for the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. <laughs> that was a mouthful. Um, so <laughs> welcome to both Richard and Sudin. We are delighted to have you here. And I'll pass the torch over to you to really tell us a little bit about Protect Our Power, and then we'll jump into our conversation. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, actually be back, uh, to be back with, uh, with uh, programs with GRI. Um, uh, thanks for the introductions. Uh, all that's great. Uh, but also my connection to GRI goes much further as I am a corporate fellow at GRI working with Steve Flynn and the entire GRI team for a number of years now on resilience issues more broadly. Uh, so it's great to be back. It's great to be back uh, with my colleague, Sudine Kelly, to talk a little bit more about Protect Our Power, uh, which is a group that, as you say, I'm a senior advisor, particularly focusing on uh, state regulatory and policy issues. Um, Sudin, I'll hand it over to Sudine in a moment to talk a little bit about the history and why um, uh, there was even a, a real desire to have an organization such as Protect Our Power, but we are we are a uh, at, uh, an advocacy organization, a national advocacy organization, uh, encouraging uh, investments and measures for cybersecurity and the grid. Uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, we are a non-industry funded organization. There is no other organization quite like us that ha is looking specifically at the cybersecurity threats and solutions for cybersecurity threats in the electric grid. And I've been very pleased to be able to work now over the last several years with Sudin and our entire team to advance this, to be that voice, whether it was in Washington, in the states, uh, with regulators and policymakers, um, and to identify with the industry, uh, the electric industry and the vendor community measures that are best practices. So we'll talk a little bit more about some of the specific programs we're working on, but it has been an honor over the last several years to work with the entire Protect Our Power team. And we do believe we've been an effective voice in all of those places I just mentioned to raise the awareness, raise the need for action, and particularly the need for investments in cybersecurity and resilience. Sudin, great to see you as always. And uh, Thank you, Rick. Go ahead. And also, very nice to be here. Thank you all for the invitation to discuss um, an issue that continues to be more and more um, pressing, not only for the electric industry, but for the whole economy of the United States. Um, and it's a pleasure to be uh, a regulatory council to protect our power, which is um, an organization that was founded in 2016. Um, it's hard to believe it was just five years ago. One of the things that motivated the funding and founding of the organization was that cyber attacks on the electric grid were just starting um, in earnest and starting to make the front pages of the newspaper. Um, it raised a lot of concerns uh, about what could happen to the electric grid if if you think of the electric grid in the United States, it's one big amoeba. Um, actually, there are three of them. There's one in the east, one in the west, and one in Texas. And it um, one of the accomplishments of American technology 
has been that we are interconnected. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, but also when it comes to cybersecurity presents a danger because uh, it is possible for any cyber attack on an entity small or big to spread across the grid because of the interconnection. The, um, in, in 2016, the National Academy of Sciences had just released its second study analyzing the threats and risks to the security of the grid. And an interest, interested group of individuals decided that there was a time and place now for an organization, a not-for-profit, an unaffiliated independent organization to see if it could advance the ball on cybersecurity of the grid. So it was formed to, with the goal of seeking to unite key industry groups, utilities, um, owners of the grid, utilities of every shape and size, investor owned, publicly owned, cooperatively owned utilities, security experts, government officials and gov entities, individuals who had been in government before and public policy influencers to work together to expedite efforts towards fortifying the grid. We, um, established a board of directors and an advisory board that now numbers about 25 individuals to cover areas of expertise that could advise the organization um, from various perspectives on cybersecurity of the grid. Former Homeland Security, for example, former Homeland Security um, individuals, individuals who were formerly uh, chief information officers at utilities, contractors who have worked on cybersecurity, and um, former government officials like Rick and like myself. And we um, were fortunate enough to receive the backing of several philanthropic foundations to enable us to begin our work. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Rick. And yeah. Add anything that you would like to to the background of the organization that I gave, but yeah. um, and please do. But I thought that you could start to talk about the specifics of the kind of work we have been doing. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks, Sudine. And um, I joined uh, Protect Our Power at the request of Sudine and our executive director Jim uh, Jim Cunningham, who's long been involved in the uh, energy and electric industry after I left the Board of Public Utilities in 2018. But um, I was pleased to be able to join an organization that, as Sudin said, had the funding and backing of uh, private philanthropic interests, not industry funding. So Protect Our Power has really been able to, because of that, the nature of uh, its support, to be an independent, objective voice on these issues. Although we do believe we have a very uh, robust and cooperative relationship with industry trade organizations and other uh, industry uh, enterprises, we nevertheless have the ability to really take a look at the issues around cybersecurity and the grid and what's needed from an objective standpoint. And that has been very uh, powerful for us to be able to use that uh, effectively as a voice. Um, and we thank our funders who have provided us that latitude. Um, we, uh, the work that we have been doing falls into several categories. And I was pleased to, when um, Sudine and Jim uh, Cunningham, the leadership had asked me to come on board after I left the BPU. And I said, what would you like me to do? Uh, the answer was simple. They said, continue what you're doing. And that's because I had the uh, great privilege as the president of the Board of Public Utilities in New Jersey and as the chairman of Neighborhood's Critical Infrastructure Committee to really lean forward at the time. As Sudin said, back in 2016-17, uh, these issues were really just emerging and becoming coming to the fore and, and people were recognizing how important they were. 
New Jersey's BPU, the Public Utility Commission, we were the first public utility commission in the country to issue a cybersecurity specific board order, specifically directing the regulated companies to take certain actions. So I'm very proud of that, proud, proud of the work we did and what New Jersey did. And I continue to lean forward on these issues very much as the chairman of Neighborhood's Critical Infrastructure Committee, encouraging my then colleagues across the country in the, the regulatory community to lean forward also in their own uh, states or their own jurisdictions on these issues. So I did, as uh, Sudeen asked, uh, continue on that effort, working uh, first uh, and one area that we have uh, really been uh, working actively in is advocating for specific uh, regulatory treatment and focus in the states. Uh, with distribution companies, and, and by the way, the broader community of public utilities that are regulated in the states, water companies and wastewater or the co-ops, for example, um, and advocating for investments that needed to be made, supporting the regulators where they needed to make those hard decisions about them, encouraging the industry to do it, looking at those best practices that could be employed as an advocate. And we worked with uh, at the time Vermont Law School to do some research across all the states about the condition of the states and their regulatory regimes. The other uh, in advocacy, and Sudeen has led much of this in Washington, is we've been a voice uh, with the FERC, uh, with other federal agencies, and then on the Hill. So most recently, we've advocated very strongly for cybersecurity measures to be integrated into the uh, uh, now passed infrastructure bill. We continue to do that uh, because there is word that the defense appropriations bill may have a broader uh, uh, a set of cybersecurity measures that could impact the, the utility and energy sector. So we're, we're advocating in those areas. Another area though that we have uh, gone on to look very actively in because no one has been working in this area is to look at best practices that are offered by the industry. Uh, being uh, an objective uh, sort of uh, um, reviewer of the offerings of the vendor community, particularly in IT, OT space, the offerings that are being made by the vendor community to, to the uh, utility sector. Um, no one has been doing any kind of evaluation. And we're pleased, by the way, that GRI has actually been a peer reviewer of a handful of those um, specific programs we're doing. And we look forward to expanding and continuing that best practices effort. And then a last uh, area, which it, we have been working pretty actively over the last year and a half is around the emerging issues of supply chain, the supply chain vulnerabilities to the electric and utility sector. We have a, a, a very strong uh, long time relationship with uh, former Governor Tom Ridge, former Director of Homeland Security with his company Gl Ridge Global. And we have for the last three years been working actively with him, focusing on supply chain vulnerabilities, the frameworks and standards that could be applied for devices that are being integrated into the grid, mostly digitized, and how the vendor community, the, buy the sellers and the buyers can come together to try to embrace standards for the equipment, standards for the interconnection, and hopefully to make the grid much more secure at the grid edge, which we all know is happening with this evolution of the grid to a smarter uh, digitized grid. So those are a number of the areas we're working on. And um, now Elizabeth, maybe it's time to come back to you to see if you have some specific questions about any of those areas that you want us to to tr try to start to highlight a little bit more. Yeah, so I would love, well, let me say that I would love for you to highlight whatever you think is the most important, but for me, some of the things, and again, coming, put it, bringing in my business world, right? We don't, we mm -hmm. don't escape any classes in the business school without talking about supply chain. Um, so if you wouldn't mind starting there, just maybe, you know, talking a little bit about what you see are the biggest supply chain vulnerabilities right now currently, um, I'd love to hear more about the frameworks and standards for, for devices and where you think that field can really go and where it could take off. And then I apologize for inundating you, but I'm just I'm just th so enthralled by it. You know, where you see, you know, I, I think in, in the international business world, so I'm always thinking globally. I know that you said that you were focusing a lot, a lot on a lot of things within the states. 
but do you see any room for maybe global standardization? So that was a lot, but if you want to unpack any of it or, or, yeah. or anything that you'd like yeah. to jump in there. Yeah, a <laughs> lot there. We could spend a whole session just on that. Um, let, me, let me make a couple of general comments about the work we've been doing, which we do think has been helpful in this. Just to go back though, several years ago, the Department of Energy had uh, begun to turn focus to this issue uh, and in fact, put out a request for information uh, now a year and a half ago. Uh, and in fact, at the time, because of what they, the DOE perceived as specific vulnerabilities, actually had put out certain directives around the potential purchase of uh, equipment or devices or even software from that was uh, coming from certain countries. Um, that has been rescinded by the Biden administration is still in process about what the future state might look like from a regulatory standpoint. But those issues are very real about equipment or systems that are coming from countries that, quite frankly, don't like us very much or our way of life. Um, and those vulnerabilities are quite real by all accounts, not from me, but by this, the national security agencies and those that deal with specific cybersecurity threats and the DOE has been very focused on it. So the follow on has been a continuing discussion between the industry, the electric industry, as well as the, uh, the, the, the assemblers, the manufacturers of the components uh, and, and that manufacturing community. As you know though, Elizabeth, that community of suppliers is some of the biggest of the big that supply these this these components and they are literally worldwide. So the the set of questions starts to become a couple. One is will the does the industry, the manufacturers, the assemblers that are in fact operating worldwide is will they embrace some self-imposed standards from a from a from an industry-wide uh, per perspective? Uh, working, for example, with the electrics or other utility companies, and many of them are. And, and by the way, many of the largest ones, for example, are also defense co contractors, contractors to the Defense Department, which now must start to adhere to a whole separate set of standards the Defense Department has um, issued under a, a regime called C, uh, C2, uh, C, CMMC, an offshoot of CM, CM, C2M2, if people know that standard. So there are specific emerging standards out of this industry, particularly some of the internationals, and there are some international standards. So for example, I know uh, Schneider Electric, that, which is worldwide, does a lot of work here in the United States, is embracing some of the international standards on cybersecurity. That work is happening, but back to what's happening here in the United States, the DOE has not yet uh, formed specific uh, directives around this on the bulk power system, which is what the DOE and the FERC would have jurisdiction over. And I'll hand this over to Sudin in a minute because there's an implementation issue. But the other piece is the states. The states and the state commissions and state energy offices have jurisdiction over what goes into the grid on the distribution end all the way down to the home or the office, even as something um, all the way down to whether it's an in-home energy manage management system, a smart thermostat, not that I'm picking on the smart thermostat people, um, but all of that gets integrated and which expands the potential uh, uh, landscape for vulnerabilities which is what everyone has to think about to try and close down any bad folks that want to try to get in and use that as an entryway to get into the system. So Dan, let me hand it over to you though, for your thoughts on the supply chain issues and then particularly the uh, implementation enforcement issues. Yeah, well, I think you've raised a lot of the supply chain issues and um, we know from the, the collaborative efforts we have had with industry participants that, um, that there are a lot of uh, difficult questions to answer here. Should it be done on a case-by-case -case basis? Should it be done on a company-by-company -company basis? Um, it, it seems that there should be something that to coordinate all those efforts or we're gonna have a lot of waste and inefficiency. Um, on the other hand, what entity exists that could um, give, give give the supply chain its blessing, if you will, or test it or certify it, or um, probably they don't exist or they maybe do exist, but that hasn't been their mission. So working on those details is what's important to actually making it happen. And that's what our collaborative is doing. Um, 
from the government's perspective and the Department of Energy's perspective, they are looking at the possibility of, of mandating it, obviously, which gets us into the legal questions. And one of the things that we should probably start with to just set the table is that our electric grid is, is a, by and large, a, a product of um, monopolies and monopoly utilities. We don't have competing electric grids, we have one. Um, and it's owned by many, many, many entities collectively. And it's because of that, it's subject to regulation. Um, the smaller parts of the system, the distribution level voltages are regulated by the individual states in which they um, exist. And the interconnected part, the transmission system, um, is, is regulated by the federal government, specifically by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that has jurisdiction over it under the Federal Power Act, which was passed in the 1930s when we started creating an interconnected grid. So one of the questions is, if you're going to mandate a supply chain protocol, uh, if you're the government, how can you do that? Um, there is... It, it, when the Federal Power Act was passed in the 1930s, they weren't thinking about cybersecurity. So there isn't a provision in, in there dealing with cybersecurity, but there are some provisions that potentially can be used um, if, if uh, the regulators decide. One of them is mandatory reliability standards. After the Northeast blackout in 2003, Congress amended the Federal Power Act in 2005 to create mandatory reliability standards. Um, these standards only apply to voltages above 99 kV, basically the transmission voltages, the higher transmission voltages. And the way that these standards are developed um, is by a very um, thoughtful, but also time consuming process it's a bottoms up process um, to come up with these standards. So that's about the only provision that is where you could impose a mandatory um, standard. And um, of course the industry could volunteer and, and the government under its, through the defense department and contracting through contractors for defense could impose effectively mandate supply chain security. Um, so I think I probably have exhausted that one, Rick. So it's, it's gonna be an issue there, on the plate yeah. of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the Department yeah. of Energy as to where to go. I think yeah. that's part of our thinking is that um, an industry collaborative approach that's not mandated um, would likely be very welcomed mm -hmm. by the administration. Yeah, and we're hopeful too that the industry can come up on its own, as I mentioned before, with suggestions on how to set a standard or a industry um, a convention for these kinds of uh, standards. And even the testing regime, we've had discussions with these buyers and sellers talking about whether there could be a use, for example, of the national labs to do testing of critical components. Uh, those that are most at risk would be most risky if they were hacked. Um, and that is an emerging thought that the, the national labs actually could be the repository of the efforts to do the testing on lots of this equipment. Let me just mention one other thing that, uh, that comes back to uh, what Sudin said about this jurisdictional issues. I mentioned the states have jurisdiction over the uh, distribution uh, level all the way down to the home or, or to the office. But um, they're not really doing too much because I think for the most part, the states are looking to see what the federal government does, what the what the DOE and the FERC does, and will probably follow a lot of that thinking on these issues. But there is one issue that's emerging now. Many people that might be attending today are involved in what's um, been set in motion by a FERC order, uh, FERC order 2222, which allows for now the aggregation of distributed energy resources literally a virtual power plant. So for example, multiple solar arrays in different locations in say one city that could be collected and then put into the grid 
as if it were a power plant, you know, 100, 200 megawatt plant. Um, and those resources, those aggregated resources under this FERC order are going to be a dispatchable resource, just as if it were a, a gas, a natural gas fired power plant or a nuclear plant to allow it to come onto the grid or power it down. So that two way flow of the electrons that's now going to come out of those virtual power plants under FERC order 2222 will start to come into the system in coming years. The, we don't really have the technology quite down, down to uh, the science that needs to be on how that's going to be done. They're working on it. But as you can imagine from what I just said and what we're talking about, then these issues around the security of the systems that will dispatch that, that co those collected dis disparate distributed resources becomes even more important because if somebody can hack into one or, or several of those, they can then potentially come back and be a threat to that dispatch that occurs on a broader level of the grid. So there's a lot to do on the regulatory side as well as the technology side. And it does uh, really call for these standards to be in place on how all this fits together as this grid evolves. FERC has done a pretty good job of confronting a number of these issues, including cost recovery issues, which is probably something else that we should be talking about. But uh, uh, Elizabeth, I'll turn, turn it back to you uh, and hopefully you've answered your, 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 your questions about the supply chain and what's going on in this whole area. No, you certainly you certainly did. And you are right when you said in the beginning, we could probably take <laughs> days and days on days and days talking about supply chain vulnerabilities. You just mentioned there's something. Do you mind getting into the cost element a little bit? Is that I know you just you just finished up saying that. I think that would be a pretty, pretty important conversation. <laughs> yeah. to well, I'll let Sudeem talk to her because I know she's spent much time thinking and dealing with these issues. But the, the, the first is, and I've said this many times, um, industry regulators, policymakers, and government officials, politicians, uh, as well as consumers have to realize this is a very serious threat and that in order to uh, try to employ the, the, the security measures we need, they're gonna be more and more costly, but they are going to be worth it to make sure that we can secure the grid and, and be resilient. Uh, that's obviously what GRI is all about, right? Making sure that if there's a threat, uh, you try to beat it back, but at the same time, if you, it's realized how you, how you respond and recover to it, these, these measures to upgrade the grid, make sure these systems are in place for protection, but also to figure out how to restart it if necessary uh, are really, really important, but going to be costly. And people have to realize that. And uh, we've been a big advocate to support decision makers in those decisions to make the investments, support the industry where that's necessary, call for even federal funding, but look at other novel ways to do it. Sudin, I know you've spent a lot of time, we've talked a lot about it. We at Protect Our Power put forward a whole number of potential ideas on how to attract the investment that's necessary. Sudin? Thank you, Rick. Um, Elizabeth, you put your finger on it. These things are costly and there needs to be, well, there needs to be a revenue stream available to the owners of the grid to implement them. Uh, we teed this up as a significant issue uh, a number of years ago, and, and it continues to be a significant issue because the entities that need to implement cybersecurity measures are the utilities that own the pieces of the grid. And there are thousands of them each owning a little piece of the grid. And as we mentioned before, they're all, almost all of them are regulated. So they receive their money through the process of regulation from electric consumers. Generally, that process of getting money from the regulator, authorized from the regulator. It happens when you're doing something at the distribution system at each individual state. If you're doing something on the transmission system, it happens at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. If the utility needs a rate increase to pay for a new cost, it has to file a rate case. They take months, if not years. So what 
the challenge is, um, well, and the, and the revenue is not dependable, right? So utilities faced with investing in cybersecurity measures, not only investing in the measures, but investing in the talent, the, inf the people um, to advise them on what to do, how to do, when to do is, um, is a cost. And it's very difficult for utilities to make that kind of investment upfront, not knowing whether it is going to be approved or disapproved. Um, so one of so this is a challenge that that we have um, uh, developed policy, potential policies around. And one thing that we think would help advance investment in the grid would be a variation on the traditional ways we regulate and provide money um, to, the, to the utilities or authorize the utilities to spend money. Typically it's, as I said, in advance or after the fact um, through a rate case, individual rate cases take a long time. Um, the Federal Communication Commission many years ago established a service fund, a universal service fund and in that case, to, to aid providing universal communication services to, to individuals and entities that don't have the financial ability to do so. Um, it is a terrific mechanism that has been very successful in the communications arena. And our thinking is that having a universal cybersecurity service fund would be very helpful. The idea is that it would be a very small charge that would be put on the bill of every electric consumer um, around the country so that everyone would make the same contribution. And it would create a revenue stream um, that would be known and dependable, uh, known in advance, and would, it, if it were dedicated to cybersecurity investment, um, it would enable the utilities, the owners of the grid to plan for the investment and to make, to really treat this like you were talking before as a business, to be able to say, hey, we understand that we need to be cyber secure. We're at a baseline. We need to get up to where we need to be. And after that, we're gonna continue to have to maintain it. So if, if there was a known budgeted amount um, on an annual basis for this, then there could be planning and, and, and real steps taken in reliance on the fact that it was going to be able to be paid for, which gets us to the second aspect of, of cost recovery. Let's say that you had that. Um, how do you distribute the money? Um, it, as we said in the beginning, small utilities are just as vulnerable to cyber attacks as large utilities. If you distribute the money based on just the number of customers each utility has, it means that small utilities are going to get a little bit of money and big utilities are going to be, get a lot of money. Yet all of them acting individually and independently have the same fixed costs. They still need a cybersecurity officer. They still need to invest in equipment. Um, and it, it compounds the problem for small utilities, cooperatively owned utilities and publicly owned utilities. So it seems to us to make sense that you should coordinate this effort in one entity that has responsibility for the cybersecurity of maybe each of the three grids so that it could be planned for across the grid so that the money could be invested um, in, in an across the grid priority manner um, and, and that it, we could um, have an economy of scale and save the waste that's involved in every of the thousand of grid owners having to have their own cybersecurity expert. If we could pool it and make it available um, and responsible to all the owners of the grid, we think that that would uh, to 
together with a known budgetable revenue stream advance the cybersecurity. And let me just make a follow on comment to that because it's timely. It was in the news earlier this week. Um, there was a co-op out West, um, which was hacked. Uh, it's not clear yet what the, uh, who the perpetrators were or exactly what the ultimate effect is on that system, but very clearly affected a fairly small cooperative. Um, and we know from our work and talking to uh, uh, leaders in the industry, but also working with other organizations uh, like Moody's does a, a, a routine survey of the uh, investments that are made to smaller um, uh, organizations like a co-op or a public, smaller public power organization. And many of them report that they just don't have the resources to make these investments. And that's why something like what Sudin has, has uh, outlined here, we've been talking about these kinds of uh, proposals are ones that really the industry and policymakers and regulators have to really spend time uh, thinking about uh, with the industry to try to get that capital, get that investment in place so that they have the resources, both physical and from a system standpoint, as well as the human capital to make sure that they're protecting from these threats. Right. I mean, Rick has pointed out this um, co-op, it's unclear whether it's a ransomware attack. Um, the co-op hasn't said that it was, although experts think that it was, but it brought down 90% of their system and they lost 20 to 25 years of historical data. Now they're rebuilding their system and, and, um, and they report that there was no sensitive information that, that was hacked. Uh, but it's the case in point that the small were interconnected. And if that cyber attack um, can spread, it can spread. It didn't in this case, it was limited to, to this um, co-op, but it, it can spread. And so trying to look at this um, challenge, cybersecurity challenge as really a challenge to a network. And we're talking the grid or the three grids as networks. Um, uh, I think is is helpful for policymakers and for the industry. I, you you have hit on so many things that we talk about in all of my business classes, right? And one <laughs> thing, and then and then, <laughs> and one thing that I um, would like to to just if I can get your quick touch points on it before I open up to questions, because I'm sure that everyone in the audience has as many questions as I do. You know, one of the things that I think about from a business standpoint, and I, and you both touched upon it, right? You know, Rick, you started talking about that there's industry regulators, policy, government, and consumers, and we have to all, as all actors in this interconnected community, understand there's a cost, right? And then, Sudin, I, I love that your discussion around the Universal Cybersecurity Fund, and I think that, you know, to me, that sounds like a very intuitive idea, but of course, we are all in this conversation actively participating because we care about cybersecurity and resilience in these issues. So I'm just wondering, from either of your standpoints, really quickly, you know, what do you think the cost would be to educate consumers that this is a good idea, right? Because I think we could all agree on this call. Yeah, I'll pay 10, five, whatever money more to make it more secure. Absolutely. But if I'm, you know, person X in a state where I don't really think about these things or see these issues, you know, or I'm not attuned to it, and I see this increase in my bill, you know, especially now with COVID and we see these, you know, cascading economic impacts, how would you convince me as a consumer? And what do you think that cost would be to convince those consumers to put that investment in? Sorry, that was long winded, no, but I, I, got, I, no. got, I got excited. A, 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 a great question, because you're right, unless it uh, affects you personally, you might not uh, be willing to, to be, you know, take that measure or support it. But I think in a situation like this, all you have to do is look at those people in Colorado that have now been affected by this, or the people in Florida that might have been affected by the hack into the water system back about four or five months ago, if that water had been contaminated. And maybe even though it was a different issue and at GRI, you know, we talk about threat, all threats, right? Uh, uh, an, all, an all hazards approach to uh, issues. Look, just ask the people, even though it was from a weather event, the folks in Texas, whether mm -hmm. they would pay to make sure that their power stayed on in the middle of a winter storm. So I think you need to look back at how any outage of the grid could affect uh, our livelihood, your operations, business continuity and the like. 
And then you ask the, that question, are you willing to pay to support the con continuity of the operation of the grid? That's really the question. And then it means looking at these different uh, 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 um, protective measures for cybersecurity, for weather events or whatever other threat you might have, and really look at the threats, look at the investments that are necessary, and then yes, tell people what it's going to cost and be honest with the consumers about what it will cost and maybe what their the consequences if they don't have that in place. Right. I think understanding, as Rick said, the consumer understanding that the grid is interconnected and looking at other aspects of the grid, um, other challenges the grid has faced, like the Texas outage. If you if you think about it, it's like, yeah. Right, that that affected um, three quarters of the state of Texas um, because the grid is an interconnected entity. So the other thing that we've done some surveys, Protect Our Power has done surveys of consumers about willingness to pay, and the surveys overwhelmingly show that people support um, paying for it. Um, a couple of caveats, right? They don't. They want. They want everybody to pay, and they want it to be fair. That's why we like the idea of a universal service charge, where everybody gets charged the same amount. I, I say everybody gets charged the same amount, um, but what I mean is different levels of customers might get charged more. But if you if you have a residential customer, it, every residential cus the idea is that every residential customer in America would pay the same amount. Um, every, every commercial customer would pay the same amount. There are a lot of customers. So that we estimate um, that it could be a small amount because added together collectively, um, you, can, you can come up with a couple of billion dollars uh, on an annual basis. Now, maybe that's not enough, um, but we think that that and this would be an advancement, no matter how much money you raise, that would be an adva advancement um, of the cybersecurity of the grid. Uh, as Rick said, as he pointed out with uh, Delta Montrose, um, the co-op in, in Colorado that had the problem, you know, it's small and it just doesn't have the ability to pay. Um, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association is an association representing rural electric co-ops, and it has stepped in um, and has said that it's helping this particular cooperative, and it is um, making cybersecurity assistance available to all of its members. And I would like to point out that um, an encouraging um, aspect of the infrastructure bill that was passed is that it would um, if it would appropriate uh, 250 million dollars yeah 250 million dollars over the next few years specifically to provide technical assistance to rural electric co-ops and municipally publicly owned utilities to provide them with technical assistance and to help them deploy advanced technology Awesome. So before I monop, I, I have so many more questions, but before I monopolize both of your time, I'd like to open up, you know, with our last 12 or so minutes here, open up to see if there's anybody in the audience that has a question, whether they'd like to ask it out loud or just put it in the chat. And I'm happy to, to read it out loud. If anybody has a question, they can go ahead and ask it now. If we have no takers, I'm just going to keep monopolizing. <laughs> All right. I, can, I can jump in here. Sorry, this is, this is Blake. I don't know if you can hear me okay. Um, Blake, no. subcheck with, with README. I was just curious to hear your thoughts. I know there was, there's been some buzz about uh, leaving the uh, critical infrastructure uh, company reporting provisions out of the, uh, out of the latest sort of um, uh, action in Congress. And I'm wondering if you have any, any thoughts on that. I know that was going to apply to, it sounds like a lot of critical infrastructure operators make them report cyber incidents within a certain time frame. Are you going to tackle that one, Rick? No, why don't you, why don't you jump in if you have thoughts? <laughs> I just, I, well, hmm. whenever you, whenever government mandates a reporting requirement, right, I think that you have to analyze, I'm not going to answer your question, Blake, <laughs> whether it's good <laughs> or bad, because gotcha. it's, 
it's going to be the lawmakers that that decide. But but when you when government mandates a reporting requirement um, on on an, an industry, uh, I think it's really important to ask, what's the purpose? What's the cost? And what's the benefit going to be? Um, in this particular case, I don't know the answer to those questions, but I suspect that's what's being debated in the halls of Congress. And I'll follow on about that issue. Um, I, 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 um, despite the method by which those kind that information flows, that information sharing is so important, and it has to be done in a very meaningful way. And one of the issues that is a concern both with the, in on the side of industry as well as with a, a particular law enforcement or national security agencies is how they can share that information in a meaningful way without um, uh, really um, doing harm to the underlying um, it, it, uh, nature of the information. That's the reason there are confidential reporting and uh, uh, regimes. Um, but one of the things that, that I know the industry, and I think at, at many levels, uh, in, uh, government agencies are, are wanting is how to share the information in a more expedient way without having those roadblocks in place, which are really somewhat artificial, um, because many times uh, the information should be shared, for example, between an, a, a law enforcement agency and the, um, and the industry, or vice versa, but for concerns that it might actually um, impinge the sources of, of the information. But that that in, that information sharing really does have to be much more robust, much more meaningful, and that means both sides, the industry and and uh, particularly national security agencies, have to be in part of that to be able to, in better time, share the information about threats, the realization of threats, and uh, to your point, Blake, when something's realized, making sure that whether it's the enforcement agencies or the law enforcement or national security or the agencies that have to deal with response and recovery have, have real good real-time information. These are really difficult issues largely because of concerns about, uh, as I said, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, disclosing the nature of how the information was received. You get back, have to work on those challenges, but there has to be much more robust information sharing going on. I agree with Rick, and I, I'd like to elaborate a little bit on, on the point, um, particularly when we're talking about sharing the government sharing um, threat information with the industry and the industry sharing threat attacks um, with the government. Um, there are challenges to both sides. There are reasons that there's a friction here, right? Government is concerned about the security of the information um, and, and wanting to deal with entities that have security clearances. Um, industry is similarly concerned if they're sharing information with the government, is it gonna be secure? And industry is also concerned about liability. And that's something we haven't talked about yet, but from a business perspective, um, we have not dealt with um, in the US what liability is for cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. when, when we decided to, to embark on, on um, nuclear energy, you know, atoms for peace, we considered in advance that there were liability, potential liability issues, and we passed, Congress passed legislation in advance of spelling out the liabilities and who had what liability and how it could be protected. Um, and that enabled a rational development of the nuclear power industry. We need to do that here with, the cyber, with cybersecurity. Um, but to get back to my point, one of the reasons, other reasons behind our policy suggestion that there be a, an overarching entity like a corporation that's in charge of the cybersecurity for a grid or a piece of the grid collectively is that you could eliminate some of this concern by having a point person 
a point entity. You wouldn't have to have um, every, every of the thousands of utilities that own a piece of the grid wouldn't have to have a, an officer with a national security clearance. Just seeing if there's any more questions. Sudeen, do you mind if I actually ask a follow-up about that? Because I'm, you know, thinking as you were talking about, you know, the costs and where it would go and, and how, you know, one of the things that I like that you brought up is exactly what I was thinking is, you know, how do you determine, you know, if I've got this big pool of money from this universal cybersecurity fund, and to your point, right, you've got these varieties of players, thousands of utilities, some of them really small, some of them really big. If you do a simple, you know, per capita or per service or whatever, you know, metric you want to come up with, you know, you're going to have some companies getting the lion's share of that fund and some companies not getting enough, but they're also vulnerable. And I really like the idea of having sort of this centralized figure that could be responsible maybe for the overarching cybersecurity. But do you think you would still run into that both need for communication, but also a communication barrier, right? So if I'm a smaller firm, am I going to trust that this overarching company or, or actor or agency is going to protect me the same way that they will protect a bigger company? Do you see any challenges in that area? I, I think that you have put your finger on it. And I think that um, in, when you set up this entity, you, you structure it so that there is a responsibility. It's either a contractual or a corporate charter, or we've talked about the fact that this entity perhaps is owned by each of the individual owners of the grid so that it is their entity. Um, because you're exactly right. One other point that I wanted to make as I heard you talk about how do you spend the money? The idea is that this entity would function much like a corporation does when it enters into a new business. It has a plan. We would see the entity starting out with developing a significant complex plan of how do I make my portion of the grid cyber secure over the next mm -hmm. 10 years, five years, depending on how much money you have to work with, right? Um, and that this plan would be a, a rational, well thought out plan that has priorities based on where the biggest areas of risks are and then invests in, in, in the plan and implementing the plan based on the priorities, which presumably are you know, where do you get the biggest bang for your buck first? And uh, another thought, we've thought lots about different options. Uh, so for example, to Sudine's point, I've, I've even talked to her about the possibility this entity could be regional. It could be a cooperative owned by or managed by the individual owner. So for example, all of the co-ops in the Southeast or the Southwest could join into another cooperative capitalize the organization and go out and, and if necessary, do a debt structure or sell, sell debt and build, put it back into and manage the organization themselves. So there are models out there about the structure of this could be as much homegrown as possible and the owners are actually the recipients of the benefits of an organization like this. That's right. And in Wisconsin and Michigan, the transmission owners did it in about hmm, 2005, uh, not for cybersecurity purposes, but for purposes of, of regionally planning and investing in their piece of the grid, the Wisconsin, Michigan piece of the grid. And they formed the American Transmission Company. And every, every member of the piece of the grid in Wisconsin and Michigan, it was optional. They didn't have to become, but they all did, including cooperatively owned and publicly owned, as well as investor owned, became an owner and a shareholder in. This one, this one was done as a corporation. They became a shareholder in the American Transmission Company, which now does for transmission planning and, and building in Wisconsin and Michigan. Um, what we're talking about potentially doing for cybersecurity. And I will just say, and, and, I, and I will leave it here, but, you know, both of your ending comments, they're really 
Remind me of why I love to be a GRI and I'm why I'm sure both of you are excited to be part of this conversation and associated, right? What you just both just said just reminds us that we can't keep being in silos, right? You know, from the business school, it's easy for me to think about profitability and business models, but, you know, in energy and in government, you also have to think about all these things. So I really love that we were able to have this conversation and, and Shadeen, you know, you brought it up several times, interconnectedness. And I think that's sort of a really big key here. So I'd like to thank you guys both for joining us and having this really fruitful conversation. Um, it's been wonderful to hear about a topic that's a little bit outside of my normal area. So I'm glad that I got to learn a ton. Um, and I hope you guys and all the audience enjoyed it as much as I did. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay. It's been bye wonderful. Bye. Take care and talk to you soon. Happy holidays. You too. Take care.